So in my last video, I kind of left hanging the suggestion that uh, this Kodiak heat exchanger could be improved if instead of having three passes in the tubes, all the tubes work together in a single pass. Um, so I thought it was kind of unfair to imply that that was the case without further investigating and so now I've decided to obsess on this and uh, do a complete calculation and figure out what will happen actually if we convert this from a three pass to a single pass. So I'm out here collecting data and here's some of the stuff that we need. Um, so up here there's the offtake from the pump, then there's a 90 degree sharp bend, then there's 12 inches of one inch diameter approximately uh, tube that's part of the pump. Then there's the through hole fitting, six inches at about one inch diameter. That's the inside diameter. Then you've got a reducer down to uh, three quarter inch. Then there's some three quarter inch tube that runs into the bottom of the uh, oil cooler. And the oil cooler tubes themselves are about seven inches tall. And there's 31 of them. Then from the oil cooler, the uh, it goes up to the uh, uh, heat exchanger. Then it goes into the heat exchanger and the first pass has, the uh, bottom pass has 32 tubes. Uh, you can see you know, the tubes over here. So it's the what bottom four rows are the uh, first pass. Yeah, so you can kind of see them. No, it doesn't matter that much. And then uh, uh, turns around and heads the other way and through the next six rows and that's 74 tubes and then at the other end it turns around and comes back with the the, uh, the top three rows which is 28 tubes. Um, so here's the uh, here's the info that's kind of what it is. Um, and the tubes themselves are 24 inches long. The whole exchanger is 28 inches long and uh, then from the top of the exchanger and I've got a, a choice here the uh, uh, one hose goes this way uh, to the exhaust the other one goes this way to the exhaust so I just decided to pick this one and say well that one's going to be the, my, my average uh, because well it, it doesn't have this hard bend right here it's just a nice straight hose and it gets to this fitting and goes into the exhaust and then I don't know what it looks like in there but I'll, I'll make some uh, educated guesses when I uh, put the program together and uh, see what happens. Now as far as the engine coolant side of the heat exchanger, uh, you can kind of see what's going on looking through the uh, cap here and you can see these tubes are packed really close together. Um, so what you need is uh, put one of these on those tubes and try to get an outside diameter of one of them and it looks like these are uh, what uh, about 0.27 inch outside diameter you know it doesn't have to be exact and then uh, get some gauges like this and figure out what the gap is between and I've got about a 0.042 gap. Um, it, that, that doesn't have to be really exact either. And then uh, also for this we need the inside diameter of the uh, the actual heat exchanger shell. You know not not this thing that's press fit in the end but you know the, the, this part. And that's uh, turns out it's about three and three quarters inches. And uh, that's about all we need. Oh, and then I thought I'd point out that the way this heat exchanger is uh, designed, it's, it's a, a triangular arrangement like this. Uh, that lets you get more tubes into the same amount of space. If you had a square arrangement like that, you actually get uh, fewer tubes in the same amount of space. If you don't believe me, you can just get a bunch of pennies and put them on a piece of paper and arrange them in a square setup like this, count how many you get, and then uh, arrange them in a triangular setup like this and count how many you get and you'll have more this way. So that's the reason they do that, so you get more tubes in there. And this information along with uh, an inlet pressure on the pump and some temperature measurements uh, for the water across the heat exchanger is about all I need and I can kind of make a, 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 a actually a really good estimate of what will happen if we convert this from a three pass to a single pass heat exchanger on the tube side. Uh, the shell side is uh, is two passes and there's probably a good reason for that. It probably makes the uh, the flow see all of the tubes a little bit better than if it was a single pass and, and I'll diagram that later so you can see what that looks like. So now I'm ready to go and uh, build the program and make all this stuff work. So I built a computer model of the cooling system and 
Uh, I really wasn't believing the uh, results that I was getting. You know, they might be right. I, I don't know. I was using some uh, information that I had secondhand about the pressure from the offtake of the Hamilton pump. And, you know, so anyway, I decided to get serious and get my own data. So I bought some of these pressure gauges like this um, with different ranges. This one goes up to, you can see, 30 psi. Yeah, uh, this one is 15 psi. And then I got a couple of these that go up to 200, you know, just in case. I heard that it would go up to 100 psi maximum, but I didn't know that for sure. Uh, so anyway, then, uh, the idea is to put a, you know, one of these T's or one of these T's in several places in the, in the line. And put hose from here to here. And then I have the uh, pressure gauge hooked up to one of these uh, little female hose thingies. Then I can swap the uh, gauges in and out as appropriate. And then along with that, I have this uh, temperature gun. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is hook up a garden hose to this system, and then I'll uh, find out for sure how much water is flowing through at certain inlet pressures, and I'll also be able to me measure the inlet pressure with the garden hose. After I use the garden hose for, to collect some test data, then I can go out into the, into the river and run the boat and see what the uh, pressure actually is, what the uh, temperature difference is across the a heat exchanger on both sides, both the river water side and the, uh, the antifreeze side. And then I'll have more information, I'll be able to come up with something that's uh, more trustable. Okay, so here everything is assembled and uh, you can see I'll just patch these guys into the cooling system. These two and then uh, this thing I can put on here and then I'll be able to connect a, a garden hose to that and get some actu actual flow data uh, based on whatever the pressure is from the hose. And uh, the, then here's our temperature measuring device. So whoever knew I would become a test engineer, but so it goes. Okay, so here's the test apparatus as installed in the boat. Uh, here's the, the low pressure gauge. This one only goes up to 15 PSI, and it's installed right next to the uh, exhaust manifold here. And then the uh, High pressure side is down there, and that one is the uh, the 30 psi gauge. Wait for this this thing to focus. Okay, I guess it's kind of doing a good job. Okay, so that one's down there. So anyway, that'll give us a pretty good idea of what the uh, inlet pressure is coming off the offtake from the pump, and go out and run the boat, see what the pressure actually is. And uh, right now, I'm going to do a test with a garden hose to see what the flow is at any particular inlet pressure. Okay, so here I am with the garden hose running full blast through the uh, cooling system. The water supply is actually somewhere between 30 and 60 psi at the wellhead, but it's uh, a few feet lower than this and then uh, quite a bit of uh, pipe and hose distance also, so there's some pressure drop to get here. Okay, so here I am ready to uh, start the test, and the idea is we uh, catch all the water coming out of the uh, exhaust cans here in these uh, buckets, and then uh, time it, and then we'll know what the flow is through the system. And unfortunately, I'm not able to get a lot of pressure out of this because the, uh, the engine cooling system, is there's not much resistance in it really, so I'm only getting about 2 psi at the uh, pump offtake. Uh, but anyway, I will get one data point, which is better than none. So I'm going to run this test. I've got to put the camera down. I don't have enough hands to do everything. Uh, so you'll just have to believe that it happened. And here's the garden hose set up. It comes in here and hooks up to this pressure gauge uh, in place of the uh, pump offtake. And I actually had to hook up the lowest pressure gauge that only has a 15 PSI range uh, because it was the only one sensitive enough to pick up the one or two PSI that was present there. So here you can see what the pressure is at the end of the hose with no flow, and it's about 35 psi. And when I hooked it up to the uh, engine cooling system, then uh, the gauge was only reading one or two psi. Uh, so you can see see kind of why that is. If I pop this valve open over here, then the flow basically drops to zero. Uh, that's because there's no re resistance over here. And so the engine really isn't offering that much uh, resistance to flow. I thought it would be a lot, lot more, but it, it's really not. 
Okay, here's another garden hose example so you can see what happens. Here I've got this yard hydrant right here and the hose comes up to this uh, bunch of valves and there's a gauge on there. It's reading about uh, 45 psi and then uh, runs out this hose and then ends up going around the yard for about 100 feet and then comes out over there. So now we're going to see what happens when I open this valve and actually let flow through the garden hose. Let's see what happens to the pressure. So there it drops down to about 10. So it's about 10 psi. But we know back at the wellhead where the pressure is established, uh, the, the pressure is still about 45 or 50 psi. So what, we, what we're learning here is that there's a lot of pipe between the wellhead and uh, this valve. You know, it might be uh, 150 feet with probably some right angle bends in there, that kind of thing. So anyway, the implication is that this 100 feet of hose downstream from this valve really isn't that big of a flow resistance. You know, it's uh, you know, 10 psi, that's it. But it's definitely a lot more than in the, uh, the boat cooling system, because there it's only like 2 psi of resistance at, at most. So I built a computer model of the water flow through the heat exchanger, and these are the important features. Uh, if you know what this stuff means, uh, then, then that's great. You can look over the list. If you don't know what it means, that, that really doesn't matter that much. Uh, but basically, it's all the uh, important features that you'd expect in this kind of a model. The first thing I did with the model was to validate it using the data from the garden hose test. And the model does, in fact, uh, predict the result to within about 10%. So that's, uh, that's pretty good, actually. So here's the data from the tests on the water. And the, uh, the red line is the pressure at the pump offtake at various engine RPMs. And the blue line is the pressure uh, at where the flow goes into the exhaust pipe at various RPMs. The exhaust pressure really isn't all that important, but it does help give more information about what the flow path looks like in the exhaust itself. You know, I can't see inside there and see what it looks like. You know, is it a 90 degree bend? Is it all convoluted and full of holes? I don't know. But that pressure buildup at higher RPMs does uh, give some more information. The pump offtake pressure starts at zero at about idle. You know, this probably isn't right. It, uh, it's probably related to inaccuracy in the gauges. They're only $15 gauges, so you know, the pressure there could not have been exactly zero. If it was, then there'd be no flow and the engine would obviously overheat. So uh, probably it's a, a PSI or two rather than the zero that you're seeing there. And then it goes up to about 28 PSI at a RPM of 3,600. Uh, you know, so you might say, well, you know, 28 PSI, that's not very much, but it turns out uh, according to the computer model, uh, that's about a half gallon a second of flow, so it really is a lot of flow. And the dashed line is a nice square function fit through the data. Uh, as you can see, it, it does actually fit pretty well, and it's sort of as expected. Uh, so then you can extrapolate to higher RPMs, what would the pressure be? I also got some temperature measurements, but I decided those aren't any good, so I'm just not going to show those. I just didn't spend enough time getting to a steady state at each engine RPM and instead move from one measurement to the next too quickly. This lack of temperature data really isn't all that important. It just means that I won't be able to say absolutely what's going on, but I still will be able to come up with a pretty good relative comparison of the three pass and one pass setup, and that's what I was after. So here's the actual result of the computer model. And in this case, I had a river water of 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the engine coolant was at 170. So you can see the engine coolant starts in the upper right hand corner and then decreases toward 140 during its first pass. And then on the second pass, it continues down and ends up at about 113 degrees Fahrenheit. The river water starts in the lower left corner at 50 degrees and then heads up toward the right and ends up you know, close to 60 degrees on its first pass. Then it turns around and splits into two, two halves. Uh, the upper half sees the first pass of the engine coolant and the lower half sees the, the second pass of the engine coolant. So one heats up a little bit more than the other. And then they join and then make the third pass together and rise to you know, close to 90 degrees. 
Now a significant uncertainty in this is the flow of engine coolant. I didn't have a good handle on that so I just had to guess and uh, you know, I just came up with a number that seemed about right based on my temperature measurements and things that I've heard second hand. So the temperature decreased by 57 degrees which is quite a bit. It may actually be significantly less than that but again what I'm after here is a relative comparison of the three pass versus the one pass so the exact number really isn't all that important. And next I built a single pass model and here's the results. You know it looks uh, sort of similar to the three pass. The engine coolant starts up in the upper right at 170 and then goes down uh, for the first pass and then continues down on the second pass and it ends up at about 122 degrees. And then meanwhile the river water it starts at 50 degrees and then half of it sees the of the first pass of the engine coolant and half of it sees the second pass of the engine coolant. Uh, so it warms up on along two different paths and and the average rise is to maybe 75 degrees. So with the single pass setup I expected the overall flow to go up quite a bit but it really didn't increase that much. It only increased by about 20 percent. So the flow was somewhat higher but unfortunately because the velocity through the tubes goes down quite a bit then the heat transfer coefficient is actually poorer. So the heat transfer coefficient falls by at least two between the three pass and the single pass. So then overall the heat transfer is not as good. And you can see that by comparing the, uh, the difference between the, the two setups. Uh, with the three pass the engine coolant decreases to about 113 degrees and with the single pass it only decreases to 122 degrees. So that's quite a bit of difference. So you might be wondering why the higher speed water has a better heat transfer coefficient and that just has to do with breaking up the boundary layer that's against the inside of the tube walls. Basically uh, the, the water itself acts as an insulating layer and so if you can break that up and get cold water against the inside of the tube wall then the overall heat transfer is better and, and that breakup happens better when the velocity is high. So that's basically why the heat transfer coefficient is higher. So for completeness I tried the computer model assuming a 75 degree river water temperature in addition to the 50 degree that I've already tried and I came to the same conclusion that the three pass is in fact better than the single pass. So there you have it after all of this work and it was a lot of work I came to the conclusion that the Kodiak heat exchanger as built with the three pass configuration is in fact better than the single pass. So now I spent all this time just to prove myself wrong and really that's sort of the preferred outcome because if I'd prove myself right then I would feel compelled to buy a different heat exchanger or have a different one designed. Um, th this heat exchanger was having trouble because it was clogged up and any heat exchanger will do that so probably the best thing to do is just get some kind of filter put it upstream to keep all the weeds and crap out of the heat exchanger. Anyway, I've learned something and now you know what I know.